This video covers part three of a four-part series exploring orbital elements, the Kepler equation, and the building of a computational model solving said problem. In the last video, I mentioned my intent was to have this be a two-video series, but both the Kepler equation and the creation of its computational model each deserve a dedicated video. If you haven't watched the first part, I'd highly recommend doing so, as the premise for the two-body problem is explained there, and the six elements defining a two-body trajectory are described in detail. If you've seen it, or are comfortable with the subject, feel free to dive in here at part three, the Kepler equation. Now equipped with the means of accurately describing the planar motion of a two-body system in 3D space, we're interested in making predictions about one of those bodies' past or future position and velocity relative to the other. Note that going forward, it's likely that I'll use the phrases state vectors and relative position and velocity interchangeably. So how do we relate state vectors at some time t initial to state vectors at another time t final? One may approach this in a number of ways, and considering we have from earlier an expression relating relative position to the elements describing a trajectory, an option is to lean into calculus to determine an expression relating position and some difference in time. But Kepler was able to achieve this goal without such knowledge, and his approach is worth digging into, as I think it makes orbital dynamics feel more approachable. How did Kepler relate initial relative position and velocities at different timestamps? His brilliant insight came through in the realm of, simply, geometry. Essentially, he compared ellipses to their simpler counterpart, the circle, while employing two basic concepts his second law of planetary motion, and the idea that objects on circular orbits travel with constant angular velocity. First things first, the second law of planetary motion, which states that a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. To illustrate the basic concept here, consider this object in an elliptical orbit starting at one of two points, PA or PB, and monitor its path over an identical time interval from the starting point. Clearly, different distances are traveled, as the object's velocity is much greater when closer to the gravitational source. In that time, the line between the bodies swept at a triangle-like area, one thin and long, the other wide and short. Despite variable distances traveled, Kepler's second law simply states that these areas are equivalent. When considering even smaller time intervals, say, infinitesimal ones, these areas can be accurately described as simple triangles, and the calculation and verification of this constant area principle becomes even simpler. While obviously Kepler didn't have calculus in his repertoire, derivation of this principle is straightforward while using it. But that's not the focus of this video, so you'll have to accept my conjecture for now. In addition to this law, he understood that an object moves with constant angular velocity when in a circular orbit. Again, let's consider the same time interval as in the last example, but for an object on a circular orbit. Regardless of when we start the clock while the body moves, the distance traveled is identical. And of course, the swept area is identical. In this case, our speed clearly isn't varying with position. And this makes sense considering that at every position on the object's orbit, it's subject to a constant force. After all, recall Newton's law of gravitation, stating that the force due to gravity applied from one body to another is expressed as follows, inversely proportional to the distance squared. 
In this case, the orbital radius never changes, thus the magnitude never changes, unlike in the elliptical case. So with constant radial distance, we have constant radial force. And with constant radial force, our object experiences constant radial acceleration. And now, recognizing that the acceleration, just like the force vector, is perfectly orthogonal to the direction of motion, gravitation does nothing more than alter our body's direction, or bend it as it flies past the gravitational source, with its speed, the magnitude of its velocity, entirely unaffected. So, to the topic at hand, Kepler's derivation. Given those two ideas, equal area and equal time, and the constant angular velocity of circular orbits, Kepler was able to produce a relationship between aforementioned t-initial and t-final and parameters of a trajectory. Consider for a second just our body at some position p, with true anomaly nu, and the area swept out, labeled a, between some t-initial at the periapsis and t-final at p. We've also labeled capital V as the periapsis point at time t initial, and the focus F where our gravitational source sits. Because we know that area is swept out at a constant rate in an orbit, we can make the following statement. The ratio of t final minus t initial divided by area A is equivalent to the period of our orbit, the time it takes to complete a full cycle, divided by the area of the ellipse, pi times A times B. We'll also later make use of Kepler's third law, shown here, which recasts the period in terms of the semi-major axis and the gravitational parameter. The only unknown here is our area A, so the problem becomes expressing this quantity in terms of known parameters. Take a look at this illustration depicting an elliptical trajectory in red. We've inscribed here a green circle of radius equivalent to the trajectory's semi-minor axis, and we've inscribed our ellipse within a larger blue circle with radius of the trajectory's semi-major axis. We've labeled a few points, C, the center of the ellipse, and the points S and Q on the line running through P to the semi-major axis in the outer circle. The angle E here is the eccentric anomaly, and it relates our elliptical trajectory to the outermost circle. The novelty here is that E is an angle related to this auxiliary circle, rather than the more complicated inscribed ellipse, and its utility will become apparent shortly. Recall that our goal here is to find an expression for the area A in terms of known parameters. We can see here that A can be expressed as the area PSV minus B. So we're now tasked with finding those two areas. The area B here is simply the area of a right triangle one-half of base SF and height PS. With a bit of trig and a handy relationship between the ellipse and the auxiliary circle, we can determine those values. As the distance between the center of an ellipse and its focus is A times eccentricity, SF is equal to A times the eccentricity minus CS. Given the right triangle highlighted, CS is simply A times the cosine of the eccentric anomaly. Hence, SF is equal to A times the eccentricity minus A times the cosine of the eccentric anomaly. As for the height PS, look to the equations and Cartesian coordinates for an ellipse and a circle. Solving for Y in the ellipse yields this. Solving for Y in the circle yields this. The ratio of Y ellipse to Y circle is simply B over A the semi-minor over semi-major axis. Since QS is simply A times the sine of the eccentric anomaly, PS then is just B over A multiplied by that, or just B times the sine of the eccentric anomaly. So the area B here is one half of A times the eccentricity minus A times the cosine of the eccentric anomaly times b times the sine of the eccentric anomaly, which simplifies to this. So that's b. Now for psv. It actually follows from the b over a relationship of the y-coordinates of an ellipse to the auxiliary circle, and the equation for the area of an ellipse, pi times a times b, 
that PSV is simply B over A times QSV. Okay, now QSV is the area QCV minus triangle QCS, with QCS simply being the right triangle area of one half of A cosine of the eccentric anomaly times A times the sine of the eccentric anomaly. And QCV being the eccentric anomaly divided by two times A squared, provided the eccentric anomaly is in radians. So QSV can be expressed as follows. Taking a step way back, A is PSV minus B. We know B. We know QSV, so we know PSV. Meaning we can express A as the following. With that, we can at last look back to our equation with t initial and t final and plug in our expression for A. Doing a bit of rearranging, and recalling from Kepler's third law mentioned earlier, that period may be easily expressed as 2 pi times the square root of a cubed over mu, we can simplify this expression. After tidying up a bit more, Kepler called this remaining constant, root mu over a cubed, the mean motion, in the entire left side of the equation the mean anomaly. At long last we have Kepler's equation stating that the mean anomaly equals the eccentric anomaly minus eccentricity times the sine of the eccentric anomaly. What's great here is that the mean anomaly updates linearly with time, meaning that if we calculate mean anomaly at any time t initial, we can very easily find the mean anomaly at any other time t final. Phrased another way, we can express any elliptical orbit with a centric and true anomaly that clearly update non-linearly, instead as a circular orbit, represented by a fictitious body moving with constant angular velocity with the very same orbital period. In the hopes of convincing you that this is pretty cool, check out this example. Here we have an elliptical trajectory in white and a circular trajectory in green. The latter trajectory is of an object moving with a constant angular velocity of exactly the mean motion of the object moving elliptically. Meanwhile, despite its varying angular velocity, the eccentrically moving object has an identical period and semi-major axis, implying identical mean motion and mean anomaly. For the sake of illustration, I'll break physics a tad here and translate the circular orbit so that it's centered over the ellipse, illustrating the synchronization and shared parameters. Mean anomaly can be understood as the fraction of an elliptical orbit's period elapsed since the object passed periapsis, just expressed as an angle. Here we can see that, near the periapsis, the elliptically moving body races ahead of its fictitious circularly moving counterpart but the latter object sort of catches up as the former approaches its apoapsis. Since we can express an elliptical orbit as a simpler fictitious circular orbit, one in which its defining angle, mean anomaly, updates linearly with time, an algorithm for solving for a body's state vectors at some point in time starts to emerge. As shown in the first video, given an object's state vectors and knowledge of its gravity source's mass, we can determine its orbital elements, including true anomaly. Next, calculate the eccentric anomaly from those elements. It's a simple geometric exercise to relate true anomaly and position to eccentric anomaly, but I'll spare you that here. From there, simply use Kepler's equation to determine our current mean anomaly at time t initial. Then, calculate mean anomaly at some other t-final by simply plugging t-final into our expression relating mean motion to mean anomaly. Now we basically step backwards through the process we just went through. Given m-final, we can get e-final. Given e-final, we can calculate the updated true anomaly. After all, the other five elements will not change for a stable orbit. There's one major problem here, though. Our expression here is transcendental, with no closed-form solution. To put it crudely, we can't solve for e in terms of m. While there are ways of expressing a centric anomaly as a pair of infinite series, we're interested in devising a practical algorithm here. 
What we'll do is apply Newton's method of root finding algorithm. This will be elaborated on in the next video, but basically, the algorithm will produce excessively better approximations of EF by making an initial guess, calculating an improved upon guess at EF, and then repeating this process until we achieve our desired level of precision. Again, we'll be looking into this in the next video as we develop a computational model, but generally, provided our initial guess for EF is good, the algorithm converges to a high degree of precision after just a few iterations. Back to our algorithm at a high level, once we have EF, recall the relationship I alluded to earlier, which gives us the true anomaly. From there, we have all six Keplerian elements solved for. As we know, only true anomaly will update with time for a stable two-body orbit. So, from here, we can easily calculate updated state vectors. I haven't discussed that process yet, but that simple inversion of the calculations covered in parts 1 and 2 of this series will be detailed in the next video. We'll also come to realize that there are a lot of problems beyond the transcendental one mentioned when utilizing the Kepler equation in practice. For one, we focused on the ellipse. What about hyperbolas? Or parabolas, where eccentricity equals 1? Given the last expression for true anomaly, we clearly end up with a divide by 0 situation with an eccentricity of 1 and a centric anomaly of 0. In general, with eccentricities near 1, our model suffers from severe computational accuracy loss, and the Newton's method algorithm may converge too slowly, or not at all. Furthermore, how do we handle multi-planetary systems, or detect possible collisions, or trajectory intersections? All considerations I hope to get to in the following videos. We'll start by building a two-body problem computational model, allowing us to update the position and velocity of an orbiting object accurately and efficiently, We'll consider the advantages of this method over simpler kinematic position update ones, then address the parabola and hyperbola question, minimize computation accuracy concerns, and eventually speak to multi-planetary systems and intersection prediction. I know I bogged us down a bit here with the algebra, geometry, and trig, but my hope is that you can walk away from this appreciating the profoundly powerful, yet simple, Kepler equation. Thank you for watching, and keep an eye out for the follow-up video. And if you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe below.